So, before going to quantum gravity, I will take up that now. Remember the vast disparity between electromagnetism and weak force as regards their ranges. Electromagnetism is of infinite range and the weak interaction is short range. So, in this so called electroweak unification through SU2 cross U1, how does this symmetry break down coming out? Electroweak symmetry has an intrinsic uh, symmetry between electromagnetism and weak interaction, but the, that symmetry has to be broken. This is achieved by a spontaneous breakdown of symmetry, SBS, engineered by the celebrated Higgs mechanism, which keeps photon masses while raising the masses of the W and Z to finite values. Once you do that, W and Z get mass, in fact the precise mass can be calculated in the theory, 80 and 91 GeV predicted by the electroweak theory with symmetry breakdown and uh, that uh, those W and Z at 80 and uh, 91 GeV were experimentally discovered in CERN in 1982. That was a great triumph for the electroweak theory. And once you know the mass, the range can be calculated. I told you the inverse relationship, actually range is H cross over MC, where M is the mass of the quantum. So, mass of the quantum is given, you calculate. You will get about 10 power minus 15 centimeter precise number can be calculated. The idea of spontaneous breakdown of symmetry in high energy physics originates from Nambu, although he applied it in a different context. But the stumbling block to apply SBS in high energy physics was the Goldstone theorem. This theorem predicted the existence of a massless mass zero and spin zero boson called the Nambu Goldstone boson as the consequence of spontaneous breakdown of symmetry and prevented the application of SBS to construct any physically correct theory since such a massless boson has not been observed except for the photon, no other massless boson has been seen. Thus, apparently one had to choose between the devil, I call the massless boson. Uh, massless zero mass boson, <coughs> massless, uh, massless W boson. See, W boson will be massless if there is no spontaneous symmetry breakdown. But if you apply spontaneous breakdown symmetry, then there is a zero mass number Goldstone boson. So you have to choose between the devil and the deep sea. It was uh, Higgs who in 1964 showed that this is not correct. He showed that there is no Goldstone theorem if the symmetry that is broken is a gauge symmetry. That is the importance of the gauge symmetry. The devil drinks up the deep sea and comes out with a regular, as a regular massive spin one gauge boson. So the massless spin one uh, gauge boson eats up the massless spin zero number boson boson and comes out with a mass. So no massless spin zero number boson bo num uh, number uh, boson boson is left. This is called Higgs mechanism. Many others, especially Higgs, Kibble, I would like to mention, only, only after Kibble uh, extended the Higgs mechanism to non-abelian gauge theories, that the next paragraph of Einberg Salam theory came. Glashow had earlier identified the correct version, correct group theory, SU2 cross U1, of the Engels theory for the electroweak unification. By combining that with Higgs mechanism, Weinberg and Salam independently constructed the electroweak part of the standard model in 1967. There is a bonus, Higgs mechanism postulates the existence of a universal all-pervading field called the Higgs field which exists everywhere now. And this field which gives masses to the W and Z also gives masses to all the fermions of the particle sector uh, which I mentioned yesterday except to the neutrinos, this is very important. It cannot give mass to the neutrinos. Thus, in principle, in particular, the masses of the quarks and the electron and muon and so on come from the Higgs field. But there is an important byproduct of the Higgs mechanism, a massive, not massless now, a massive spin zero boson or called scalar boson. Spin zero boson, the corresponding quantum field will be a scalar field for spin one particle like photon or W boson, the corresponding field will be a vector field. For uh, gravitation, it is spin 2, a tensor field. Okay. So, <coughs> there is an important byproduct of the Higgs mechanism, namely a massive 
spin zero boson called Higgs boson, that is what is called now Higgs boson, must exist as a relic of the original Higgs field. And it is this <coughs> Higgs boson which was searched by high energy physicists in all the earlier particle accelerators, they failed to find it. Finally, it was found in the Large Hadron Collider, gigantic particle collider at uh, CERN Geneva in 19, uh, with a mass of 126 GeV in 1912 it was discovered and that has been welcomed by everybody. In the last four decades experimenters have succeeded, did succeed in confirming every part of the uh, full standard model with three generations of the fermions. Higgs boson remained as the only missing piece. So, with its discovery, standard model has emerged as the standard theory describing nature. It's a great scientific, engineering and technological achievement. Now, a little bit more on the spontaneous breakdown of symmetry for those of you who want to know because this has now become an important part of physics. First, consider a simple mechanical example. A ball placed on the top of a hill of circular cross-section. This is the hill of circular cross-section and on the uh, top of it you put a ball and this uh, circular mountain is surrounded by a circular valley. Okay. Sometimes it does not work. No. So, I put a ball on that uh, top of the circular mountain. So, it is a, the whole thing has a circular symmetry now. Circular symmetry, circle uh, around the z axis. But the ball is in an unstable equilibrium and will fall down into the bottom of the valley where it will reach a point of stable equilibrium as shown there. The ball could have come to a point, to any point along the circular bottom of the valley, but once it has done it, the circular symmetry is broken. As compared to here, the circular symmetry there has been broken. Now, I go to the field theory, corresponding field theory example. Replace the hill and valley problem with a problem of field theory. This is Goldstone's model of the scalar field, that spin zero field, which has two components, <coughs> phi 1 and phi 2. It has two component field. And uh, the quanta of the scalar field of spin zero, as I already mentioned, and hence, or bosons. The potential energy V of the field system as a function of the field components is chosen to be exactly like in the mechanical uh, system and a circular symmetry now in the field space. We rotate around the, the z axis uh, <coughs> in the phi 1, phi 2 plane, there is a symmetry. It has a maximum energy at point A, top of the hill, where phi 1 and phi 2 are 0 and a minimum along the circle. It is wrong to choose the maximum of the potential, namely the point A, as the ground state of the field system, although the field is zero at that point, since it is a state of unstable equilibrium, exactly like in the mechanical example. We can choose any one point along the circle of minimum of B as the ground state of the system. However, once we choose it, the circular symmetry of the is broken. This is the mechanism of SBS, spontaneous breakdown of symmetry. An important consequence follows, since it does not cause any energy to move around the circular trough of minimum potential, you move along that circle, the potential energy remains zero. Since it does not cause any energy to move around the circular trough of minimum potential, there exists a massless particle that is the alpha mode. The circular mode is the alpha mode. So instead of phi 1, phi 2 modes, Cartesian modes, I now go to uh, polar coordinates, one circle and one radius. So the circular mode uh, uh, has zero energy and zero mass and hence zero mass. Remember, whenever I talked about energy, in fact, I forgot to mention yesterday, when I talked about the Einstein energy E equal to root of m squared c squared plus. Uh, P, uh, m squared uh, c power 4 plus uh, p squared c squared, that is the total energy including the rest of mass energy. If you put the kinetic energy zero, momentum zero, it becomes the famous E equal to mc squared formula. We should not never talk about E equal to mc squared as species. We should always talk about this more complete formula. Okay. So, 
<coughs> since the energy cannot be zero if m is not equal to zero, because two squares are added in order to get E. So m has to be zero for that mode. That is the alpha mode. Movement along a direction normal to the circle that will climb along the hill, climb the hill, and so that causes energy, and that is the beta mode, and that corresponds to the massive particle. Alpha <coughs> is a massless mode. That is the number Goldstone boson. And beta is the massive mode that corresponds to the Higgs boson. That is the massive particle. The massless particle is called the number Goldstone boson, and the result is called the Goldstone theorem. It was proved by Goldstone, Salam, and Weinberg, which states that the spontaneous symmetry breakdown of any continuous symmetry results in the existence of the spin zero massless number Goldstone boson. But we know that this theorem is wrong, as I already mentioned. Why? If you had a massless spin one gauge boson to the system, Goldstone model, to the Goldstone model, thus elevating the original circular symmetry to a gauge symmetry, Higgs showed that the massless spin zero boson is eaten up by the massless spin one boson, and as a result, the massless, <coughs> massless spin one boson becomes massive, and the massless spin zero boson disappears. This is the Higgs mechanism. The massive spin zero boson, the beta mode, however, exists, and this is the Higgs boson, which was searched for and finally found. Note that in the ground state, the field is not zero, but equal to the radius of the circle of minimum potential. This is the universal Higgs field existing everywhere that gives masses to all the particles, electrons, quarks, and so on, except for the neutron. Now, more or less, the, my description of standard model is complete. But standard model is not the end of physics. So what are the things which may exist, which do exist in beyond standard, beyond standard model? Let me talk about it. First is neutrinos. Neutrinos are massless in the standard model. As I already mentioned, Higgs mechanism does not give mass to the neutrinos. However, about 20 years ago, experimenters discovered that neutrinos do have masses, although they are very tiny. And this has been hailed as a great discovery since this may show us how we can go beyond standard model. Neutrinos may be the door or window to go beyond standard model. And that is the importance of the INO, Interbase Neutron Observatory, about which I will talk on Monday. Next, dark matter. Astronomers have discovered that most of the matter in the universe is not the kind we know. What we know? constitutes only 5% of the total energy budget of the universe. 95% is simply unknown. They are simply called dark. Known through gravitational interaction, but nothing else is known. A uh, major part of that 70% is dark energy, which is even stranger. But 25% uh, is dark matter. That's what I'm talking about. Da dark energy, we do not know. That may be the realm of uh, gravity, so we may not be able to solve until we have quantum gravity. But dark matter, if it is matter, then it is a realm of particle physics. We have to solve it. It is called dark matter because it does not emit, absorb, or scatter light. Although this discovery has been made already by astronomers through their gravitational interaction, nobody knows what this dark matter is, and only physicists can discover it. A dark matter experiment also hopefully will be mounted in the INOK1 suitably extended. What are the other things? In the last four decades of the standard, after the standard model was constructed, theoreticians have not been idle, but have constructed many theories that go beyond standard model. One of these grand unification I already mentioned in the very beginning. Another is supersymmetry, which I have not mentioned so far, so let me briefly mention it. It postulates the existence of a boson corresponding to every known fermion and vice versa, corresponding to a spin half electron, there has to be a spin zero electron. Corresponding to the spin one photon, there has to be a spin half photon. All these have to exist. This is a very elegant symmetry. That is why the theoreticians are very much interested in it. it. In fact, it leads to even a better quantum field theory than the one on which standard model has been built. Standard model, as I have described, I have not talked about it, but it, it has this divergence problem which is not yet solved. It is simply shoved under the carpet, and then we are able to do it through the so-called renormalizability of the theory. <clears throat> but the full uh, uh, solution is not there. 
and uh, quantum field the, the, the supersymmetric quantum field theory helps in that. It does not completely solve the problem. For that, you need a super string, but quantum, uh, super, super string, the string theory which I will talk about also will have supersymmetry. That is another reason why theory relations like supersymmetry. But if supersymmetry is right, we have to discover a whole new world of particles equaling our known world, corresponding to every fermion, a boson, corresponding to every boson, a fermion. Remember, we took uh, more than 100 years to discover all the known particles starting from uh, electrons. So patience is needed in order to discover supersymmetry. There are many more theoretical speculations which I won't even mention here, apart from grand unification and supersymmetry, but none of them has seen even an iota of experimental support so far. That is unfortunate, even in the Large Hadron Collider. Our Large Hadron Collider <coughs> has many more years of operation, it is healthy, and hopefully it will discover new things. Of course, the biggest loophole in standard model is that gravity has been left out. I've already mentioned. So the most successful attempt to consider quantum gravity is the string theory, but it's still an incomplete theory. So quantum gravity is the next frontier and the journey continues. So let me now go back to the earlier thing. But before that, since the uh, standard model part is complete, I can flash this transparency. Some of the people who have got Nobel Prize for uh, standard model, the theories, and the experimentalists are given here. Blasio Salam Weinberg, the year in which they got the Nobel Prize. They, especially the theorists got the Nobel Prize much after, many years after they made their discovery. Blasio Salam Weinberg, <coughs> that uh, corresponds to 1967. So see, Nobel Committee took 12, 20 years almost. That is a construction of electrophic theory. Rubia and Wandermeer, the, the first major experimental verification of that, namely they discovered the W and Z bosons with masses uh, <coughs> 78 and 90 GeV in 1984. Friedman, Gendal, and Taylor observed the quarks inside the proton, observed I have put it within inverted commas. Quarks don't come out, but still they managed to observe it through the so-called high energy electron scattering on proton called deep analytic scattering. Uh, Professor Murthy might have told you about it. And as seen by high energy electron as a probe, it looks as if there are point constituents inside the proton and they were later identified as the quark. This was really the discovery of the quark. It is somewhat like the discovery of the nucleus by Rutherford in 1911. He uh, scattered uh, alpha particles on gold atom and found point nucleus. So point quarks <coughs> discovery is like the discovery of the point uh, uh, nucleus. Toot and Beltman was a pure theoretical discovery. They proved the renormalizability of electrophic theory. And that was an important step, because without renormalizability, we cannot really calculate anything. Quantum electrodynamics was already known to be a renormalizable theory. What is renormalizable theory? People who learn quantum field theory will know it, will, will, will have to know it. It is a uh, renormalizability allows uh, to extract meaningful finite results to be compared with the experiment in spite of the terrible divergences in quantum field theory. So renormalizability is very important. And they proved that the electrophic theory has renormalizability. And the other part, QCD, of course, has renormalizability. Uh, <coughs> so the full standard model is as renormalizable as the electrodynamics is. So as decent as electrodynamics is. Gross, Pulitzer, and Wilkes, Gross and Pulitzer, and Wilkes separately, they discovered the asymptotic freedom of Yang Mills theory, namely, Angle's theory applied to QCD. That is how Angle's theory was used to construct QCD. Why? Friedman, Kendall, and Taylor not only found the point particles, they found that the point particles, as observed by high energy electron probe, behave as if they are free. Of course, quarks are I'm sorry. Of course, quarks are not free. They are very strongly interacting. Otherwise, they will not bind the inside the proton and neutron. Nevertheless, as subject through very high energy probe like electron, they behave as if free. Very high energy, that is why it's called asymptotic energy. Asymptotically, they behave like free particles. It's, it's called asymptotic freedom. And they, it was found actually that the only theory, quantum field theory, which has asymptotic freedom is Yang Mills theory, namely non abelian gauge theory. That is why non abelian gauge theory became important for strong interactions. And uh, the theory which was constructed. Uh, was called quantum chromodynamics. I have discussed it yesterday. Uh, Nambu, <coughs> for uh, 
being the initiator of the idea of spontaneous breaking of symmetry in particle physics. Kobayashi and Moscow, I already mentioned yesterday, matter, antimatter, asymmetry, how to introduce it into the standard model by having three generations. And then finally, <coughs> Engle and Hicks. There are many people who have contributed. Chiefly, Kibble has been left out, which is an unfortunate thing. It is a mistake which the Nobel Committee committed. Anyway, uh, for the Higgs mechanism, Engle and Higgs got the Nobel Prize. So now let us uh, go back to the earlier transparency. So standard model, uh, uh, whatever I want to say, I have said now. Complete, it is complete now. Quantum gravity, I am going to quantum gravity now. Quantum gravity has become the most fundamental problem of physics. The most successful attempt to consider quantum gravity is string theory. Actually, string theory offers much more than a quantum theory of gravity. It provides a quantum theory of all the other forces in forces, or in other words, it can incorporate the standard model of high energy physics also within a unifying framework that includes gravity. In string theory, just uh, one or two slides on string theory. String theory itself is a huge subject now. So we cannot do full justice to it here, but it is good to know where particle physics have to know string theory. Ultimately, particle physics will be covered only by string theory. In string theory, a point particle is replaced by a one-dimensional object called the string as the fundamental entity. That one-dimensional object may be like a open thread or a loop. And the length of that string is about 10 power minus 33 centimeter. Please remember this 10 power minus 33 centimeter, which is the length scale of any theory of quantum gravity, including string theory. The various vibrational modes of the string correspond to the elementary particles. So that is string theory. String theory automatically contains quantum gravity, and that is its special brevity. Remember, quantum field theory could not incorporate Einstein's gravity. You get into trouble, as I mentioned yesterday. Whereas in string theory, it is opposite. You cannot construct a string theory without gravity. That itself shows what way to go. However, that success is brought, bought at a price. It works only if the number of space dimensions is 9. And including time, it becomes 10 dimensional space time. Where are the extra 6 spatial dimensions? They are supposed to be curled up to form space bubbles at distant scales of the same 10 power minus 33 centimeter. Both the string and the extra curled up dimensions of 10 power minus 33 centimeter will be revealed to us only when we can access such length scales. So, has string theory solved the problem of quantum gravity? Yes, perhaps. But how do we know? Where is the experimental support for string theory? Remember, that is the problem of string theory. It's not a theoretical problem, it's a problem of experiment. Remember, it took 40 years to verify the standard model as the correct theory of nature. That required the construction of particle accelerators and particle colliders of higher and higher energy, ultimately culminating in the construction of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN Geneva, reaching energies in the TeV region. It works now at 14 TeV. This machine is a behemoth, it's a monster of a machine. It is a circumference of 28 kilometer underground. And its construction took 20,000 physicists and engineers from all over the world, including our country, working for 20 years. In relativistic quantum mechanics, there is again an inverse relationship between the length scale and the energy required to probe it. If you want to probe a length scale of L, then the energy required is inversely proportional to it. Again, you have to put H cross and C and so on in order to balance this equation. Remember, I said at the beginning of my talk that we have descended down to a length scale of 10 power minus 17 centimeter. To probe this, we needed the TeV energies at large hadron collider. So, to probe the length scale of quantum gravity, namely 10 power minus 33 centimeter, we need 16 orders more energy, namely 10 power 16 TeV. This is the energy required to experimentally test string theory, or for that matter, any theory of quantum gravity. Most people think this is not possible. This is the crisis in fundamental physics which I mentioned in my title. 
Galileo had decreed that laws of physics are written in the language of mathematics, but those laws can be proved or disproved only by experiments or by direct observation, astronomical observations. For 400 years, physics has progressed only by following the path decreed by Galileo. If you give up this path now, that will be the end of fundamental physics. That is why I call it a crisis for fundamental physics. In that case, all the beautiful theories that we build for quantum gravity, including string theory, will remain as mere metaphysics. What is the way out? I have a few comments on cosmology here, but I don't want to. Unless somebody asks questions on cosmology, we will come to that later. <clears throat> Instead of cosmology, we have to make a direct attack on the high energy frontier. Instead of merely scaling up the sizes of the accelerate, accelerating machines, that's what has been happening, we must discover new principles of particle acceleration. Either new principles of acceleration have to be discovered or there will be an end to high energy physics by about 2040. 14 TeV machine is the highest machine now, they want to go up to 100 TeV. Maybe they, let us give them uh, uh, the possibility of even going up to 1000 TeV beyond that. The conventional methods will not work, even the whole circumference of Earth will not be enough to accelerate. So we have to have other methods. So this conclusion that uh, we have to have new principles of acceleration has nothing to do with the quantum gravity or uh, Planck energy and power 16 TeV. It will, it is it's a practical question now. The growth of accelerator energies over the past 80 years has been phenomenal. The energy has been increasing by a factor 10 every 6 years. At least it did so uh, up to some 10 years ago. See, once the SSC was brought down, <coughs> the scale has come down now. We have to retrace that. I interpret this exponential growth, namely a factor of 10 every 6 years, as an optimistic sign for the future of fundamental physics. So, if the same growth can be maintained, 16 powers of 10 can be reached in 96 years, 16 into 6. 96 years may be too much by any human standard, but remember, even to verify standard model, we took 40 years. So, 96 years is, in that sense, not too long. But, this is possible only if new principles of acceleration and newer technologies are continuously invented. See, otherwise, Cockroft and Walton uh, <coughs> machine, and then uh, Van de Graaff, and then uh, uh, cyclotron, super cyclotron. If you look at uh, the, uh, there's a thing called Livingston plot, from there only I have taken these numbers. <coughs> that Livingston plot gives a linear uh, rise in the logarithmic scale, energy of the accelerator, and that has the slope of this uh, 10 every six years. But that is only the over, uh, the, the, uh, the envelope of the various curves. If you stick to one particular kind of accelerator, it always saturates, energy saturates. You cannot increase it any further. That's what we have reached now, a saturation. And so we have to go to the next level, next level of technology, and uh, that has been happening. Next level of technology, and the envelope of that has that linear uh, slope. That is why new principles of acceleration, uh, uh, especially newer technologies, have to be continually invented. What are the new principles of acceleration? I will give one example. In the last 30 years, many ideas on laser plasma acceleration are being pursued. Using laser excitation of plasma wake fields, electrons have been successfully accelerated to 1 GeV. GeV means 10 power 9 electron volt in 1 centimeter compared to kilometers <coughs> which are required for conventional accelerators to get similar energies. So, accelerators can be brought to tabletop. Tabletop accelerators are perhaps not far away. Maybe this will lead to breakthroughs that will help us to cross the super high energy barrier. I don't claim that laser plasma acceleration alone will uh, take us to the Planck energy, 10 power 16 TeV, but it will be an important step. What we need are a hundred crazy ideas. Maybe one of them will work. Maybe the breakthrough will come from one of you, students. So this is an excellent opportunity and challenge for experimentally oriented students. I want to say a little bit more about the string theory. Strings live in a 10-dimensional world, I have already said, having six compact space dimensions uh, of dimension 10 power minus 33 centimeter, in addition to our familiar four-dimensional space-time, which is of infinite extent. 
What is the shape of the six dimensional compact manifold? One possibility is this, the so called Calabia manifold, which mathematicians <coughs> found, and the string theory is found that that is a suitable one. It may be that if we know the correct six dimensional uh, manifold with all its warts and holes, string theory will determine the properties of all the dozens of elementary particles and even standard model will follow from that. That is the hope. I mean, attempts have been made. In fact, many, many models of the kind of standard, of the, of the type of standard model have been already constructed. Which one is correct, we do not know. Of course, we know one to be correct. Why nature chooses that one, we do not know. So string theory is capable of constructing standard model and even many models of that kind. So there is no doubt about it. We now know that in addition to the one-dimensional, this is an important point, we now know that in addition to the one-dimensional strings which I mentioned, that's why it's called string theory, but string theory automatically contains two-dimensional membranes like paper and in fact brains of higher dimensions too, up to nine dimensions if we can construct brains. They are all contained in string theory. You don't have to put in by hand. Once you start off string theory, like in quantum field theory people would have heard about solid terms. Other objects like solitons come up. So all these brains are solitons in string theory. So string theory is the relativistic quantum dynamics of a mind-boggling variety of interacting extended objects living in a ten-dimensional world. So obviously you can see how complicated it is, both physics ways and mathematics ways. It is rich mathematics and physics. Its richness is continuously being discovered. So no wonder string theory is so difficult. That's why many physicists don't like it, but you can't help. It, nature is like that. So no wonder string theory is so difficult, but it will be mastered through mathematics. String theory requires the creation of new mathematics, even that is being done. All of great mathematics will have to be used in get, gaining control of string theory. I think that's all I have to say. String theory is a top candidate for a correct theory of quantum gravity which is the next frontier in fundamental physics after the spectacular success of the standard model of energy physics. However, string theory is so complex that it requires all the mathematics that is even yet to be discovered. So this is the ideal area for ambitious students who are mathematically oriented. People who are experimentally oriented should think of discovering new principles of acceleration, starting with laser plasma acceleration. People who are theoretically oriented should learn enough mathematics to gain control of this 10 dimensional world. I think that's all I have. So I have finished before my time. So there is ample time for discussion. Anything in particle physics or quantum field theory you want to ask, including what I have said, you can now ask. Yes? Yeah. Oh, maybe I'll. Okay. Yeah. How do you define a dimension? Dimension. This is space is three dimension. This room is three dimension, right? Length, breadth, and uh, height. So that is the length dimension. Length squared will be area, length cubed will be what, what, volume. What does it mean for a dimension to be curled? Oh, you are talking about that dimension 10 4 minus 33 centimeter. No. Uh. What? You talk about curled dimensions, like curled. Oh, one possibility is suppose you think of spheres. A point is not a point. If you look at it uh, with a sufficient high power microscope like a high energy machine, it will show up as a circle, uh, uh, as a sphere. So that will be a two-dimensional uh, two dimensional uh, compact space. But what we need is a six-dimensional object. You have to imagine not a sphere of two dimensions, but a sphere in six dimensions. So every point, if you probe sufficiently deeply, will reveal itself to be a six-dimensional object very complicated it is. And you have to understand it both mathematically as well as physically. Then only string theory can be understood. So the more deeper I look into the object, like the point, so the bigger it gets. Right? Yeah, it's so not a point anymore. So the, the, range, the range is infinite. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, so but at 10 power minus 33 centimeter, you reach an important change that it becomes uh, <coughs> a curled up object of six dimensions. I am not saying that that is the end of physics, <clears throat> but that itself is so far away that I don't want to look beyond that. Yeah. Yes. Saying that, uh, 
the unless uh, people develop the high, high energy accelerators. New ideas. Yeah, the string theory may not be verifiable. That's what you said. You cannot test. You theory. cannot test. You cannot test. See, physics yes. is physics only if you can test all the ideas. Yes. Unfortunately, string theory is so far away. I mean, the length scale needed, the yeah. energy scale needed is so high yes. that present day experiments cannot handle it. Now, the same conclusion, your yeah. conclusions will apply for the other alternative, uh, which is known as the loop quantum gravity. Yeah, I did yeah. not mention. Uh, it, 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 also, not it also string requires. Theory is not the only candidate for quantum gravity. There are other approaches, especially equally famous is a loop quantum gravity. Many people in this institute also ha had been doing it. But in my opinion, string theory has a better chance of success. One reason why I am saying that is, String theory already incorporates particle physics, standard model. Loop quantum gravity can, has not done it. Okay. Whether they will be able to do it, I don't even know. But in, in terms of testing the theory, yeah. in terms the of testing... Loop quantum gravity also will have the same problem. Will have the same problem. Exactly. Ah, that's what that's I, I said, want. any theory of quantum gravity, testing needs these high energy machines. High energy machines. Okay. Thank that you. That beyond our scope right no. now. Any other question? No question from the backbenchers, from the students. Can I just make one comment? Oh, yeah, please do, Murthy. One is, uh, of course, uh, the string theory uh, to be considered as a candidate it requires the discovery of supersymmetry. Yes. So far, no evidence. So far. But it can come any, any, time, any time, you know. Now, for a TV, we are working at TV scale. Yeah. Up to 10 power 16 TV, there is so much of region at any energy scale, supersymmetry may be discovered. That is enough for. Point, uh, first uh, step in this. Yes, yes. Uh, supersymmetry. I completely agree with you. Is I, com to go towards I completely agree. And you can never say that it can. It has not been found because nobody has said that it cannot be found at the next energy region. That is true. Yeah, that is a, that is a, that is a whole problem. We have uh, much leeway to go to power 16 TeV, and it may lie anywhere. The low energy supersymmetry has not been found up to TeV scale. It has not been found, but it may be a 10 TeV LHC cannot discover it. The next machine can discover it. That is a prerequisite. Yes, it is a prerequisite. Without supersymmetry, string theory will not make sense. Supersymmetry, I mean, string theory works only with the ten dimensions and the supersymmetry. I forgot to mention that. How about, how about loop, loop on a gravity? That also requires a supersymmetry. I don't, I don't think so because they have not reached the near particle physics at all. It's very difficult to say. Maybe they have been able to do it now, but the original version of loop quantum gravity was not supersymmetric. Higher dimensions also they did not do only. They just took Einstein theory and tried to contest it. That is a great merit of that. You don't have to do anything else. But I think in that process they have mutilated something, but I don't want to say it openly. I am not an expert. Whereas in string theory, Einstein gravity comes as a low energy approximation. And it has many other things beyond Einstein gravity. Whereas loop quantum gravity will not have anything more than Einstein gravity. You can say loop quantum gravity comes from the geometrical side, whereas string theory comes from the particle physics side. But both the theories uh, it may are back around, back around uh, space and time. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Which is yeah, yeah, that is true. But, 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 but loop quantum gravity works in uh, four-dimensional space-time, whereas string theory will work only if it is ten-dimensional space -time. And also it has to be supersymmetric space-time. Supersymmetry, in some sense, is like giving uh, fermionic, uh, uh, fermionic uh, characteristics. Uh, see, the space-time dimension, we talked about four dimensions or even ten dimensions. The dimensions themselves, actually, the, the x mu, the coordinate, behaves like a bosonic variable. They commute. You have to bring in anti-commuting variables. So every space-time point is not to be discarded by these ten numbers. but 
uh, anti-commuting variables, which are fermionic variables. So the concept of space-time itself gets enlarged in supersymmetry. That angle has not been pursued much, but finally when supersymmetry is found, you will have to recognize that the structure of space-time is very different now. Because it is fermionic coordinates in addition to the bosonic uh, space-time coordinates. Yeah, yeah, somebody was raising hand. Uh, you have the mic. Anyway, please shout others. Uh, for every there is a yeah. Space. How can this uh, assumption solve the problem? For every there is a person and vice versa. How can this assumption solve the problem? See, uh, you have to enlarge the theory. For instance, quantum electrodynamics. Take quantum electrodynamics. Quantum electrodynamics has two kinds of particles, electrons and photons. The electron has spin half. It is described actually by a Dirac field, but the photon is described by the Maxwell field or actually the vector potential MU. So MU and psi, these are the two fields. Their quanta are the photon and uh, electron. Now we have to enlarge this theory to include one more field corresponding to photon, which is spin half, it is called photino. And one more field corresponding to electron with spin zero, it's called the scalar electron. Okay? So there are four fields instead of two fields. Quantum electrodynamics gets extended. So like that, standard model also will get extended. So there is, a, uh, I mean, all the fields are doubled up. Corresponding quanta have to be discovered, otherwise supersymmetry is not there. Everything finally has to be verified by experiment. Supersymmetry has made tremendous theoretical progress, like string theory. But again, no. Experimentally, one of the aims of Large Hadron Collider is to discover supersymmetry. That aim has not been satisfied. Even now, they are searching for it. They may find it tomorrow. It will come in newspaper if it comes. Or they may find it after 10 years. Or they may not find it. They may have, they may have to go to the next accelerator of 100 T, which is being planned. Only in the planning stage, whether it will be funded, we do not know. Yeah. Sir, you've said uh, for supersymmetry, we have to keep on going to higher and higher. Yeah. Uh, yeah. TV, but uh, that's a very long range, yes. but there has to be a guess at where we might find it. Uh, it, it we can't say that it might be somewhere between 1 no, TV and No, unfortunately, no. Uh, sorry, theoreticians did uh, guess that it will be found at LHC because there is a theoretical reason I did not want to mention. See, there is a famous hierarchy problem because quantum field theory of, of which by which standard model is built has these divergences. As a consequence of that, one thing has happened. What has happened is, remember the Higgs boson was found at 126 GeV. All other particles are found at 100 GeV. Uh, the W and Z are uh, about 100 GeV, 78 and 90 GeV and so on. Whereas, everybody knows that quantum gravity is there. Distant, but it is there. And its energy is 10 power 19 GeV. The 10 power 19 GeV affects this low energy particles in quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, anything which is there will affect anything which you see even at lower energies. That is the problem. In sp that is the reason why the divergences come. In spite of that, we have made progress in constructing standard models because of the renormalizability. But this problem exists. Since 10 power 19 GeV will affect this 126 GeV, what it does is it pushes this 126 GeV also to 10 power 19 GeV. So the stability of the low energy sector is lost. This is called the hierarchy problem, and this hierarchy problem can be solved if supersymmetry exists. This is one of the main reasons. Ramesh Kaul, who is here, in fact, he was the author of this idea. That is why supersymmetry became a sought-after thing. Uh, that is a low-energy supersymmetry. It has to be a low-energy thing. Uh, uh, up to about one TeV if supersymmetry is found, it would have solved this hierarchy problem. Unfortunately, it is not being found, but it may be a 10 TeV, or maybe hierarchy problem is not a serious problem. Anyway, the divergence problem will get solved once superstring is there. So maybe hierarchy problem is only a red herring. I don't know. So uh, hierarchy problem suggested that supersymmetry will be found around one TeV. Otherwise, there is no prediction where the supersymmetry. There are other things which we cannot talk about because dark energy problem also uh, <coughs> will give you a hint about supersymmetry and so on. Because if supersymmetry is the exact, then uh, there cannot be dark energy. But dark energy has been found experimentally. And uh, that corresponds to perhaps supersymmetry being broken. We do not know. Because ground set energy has to be zero 
your supersymmetry is exact. Now we know that the ground state energy is not zero, that is the dark energy. What is called dark energy is just the ground state energy. That ground state energy also has gravitational attraction, that is why the universe accelerates. People had ignored it so long, but finally the astronomers found that the universe is uh, not only expanding with a certain rate, but the rate goes on increasing. So experimentally, it came back to them that the ground state energy, which we always ignore in quantum field theory, but we, gravity told us that it cannot be ignored. That is the discovery of uh, dark energy and acceleration of the universe. But that is cosmology. But you see, all these things are connected to particle physics also. Because you remember when I showed you the Higgs potential, the potential and so on. See, the potential I chose to be zero. At phi, at, uh, at a finite value, the uh, existing Higgs field, give, uh, for that, I had chosen the potential uh, zero arbitrarily, which is not correct, because uh, the potential, uh, in fact, there is a positive energy. Even in the ground state, there is a positive energy. That is, a grav that is the... Uh, uh, dark energy, are also called the uh, Einstein's cosmological constant. So we had put it zero, but we cannot put it zero. But if you begin to calculate in uh, high energy physics, in quantum field theory, it comes out infinite. That is why we ignore it. Remember, when you do quantum field theory, there is always the zero point energy. Single harmonic oscillator, you can forget it. But there are uh, field, any field theory is equal to infinite number of harmonic oscillators. It gives you infinite energy for zero point energy, and we simply remove it saying that uh, I, can, I can choose the zero of energy, anything, anywhere I like. That is what we teach to students even in school. That is not correct. You cannot choose the zero anywhere you like. As far as the rest of physics is concerned, it is okay. But as far as gravitation is concerned, as I told you, in Einstein's area of gravitation, it is the energy which, are, which has gravitational interaction. So you, uh, zero of uh, energy scale is not arbitrary. It is there, it is fixed by physics, and you have to put it. And uh, so, somehow the calculation has to be redone so that this finite number, the Einstein's cosmological constant, comes. But nobody has managed to do it. Although, in the earlier days, uh, once the cosmological constant was discovered, people doing supersymmetry were trying to do it, but I don't think they have done it yet. So all these problems are connected, particle physics, supersymmetry, uh, dark energy, all these. Dark energy we so far ignore, we have been, in particle physics we have been ignored, only dark matter, <laughs> there are experiments which are being done. Dark energy also some experiments are there, they are basically not particle physics experiments, but also astrophysical experiments. Any other question? If there is none, I think uh, we can stop. See, uh, Pascal had used to tell that there is ah. a connection between what is happening here in particle physics and what is happening in the mechanism. Oh, sure. Especially the Higgs, Higgs mechanism. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So See, the pa yeah, let me, let me say what Pascal is correct. Actually, I mentioned Nambu. I think Nambu himself quotes Anderson. Anderson had uh, shown there is spontaneous symmetry breaking in, um, in um, this thing. Uh, superconductivity. So, um, Bhaskaran and uh, people like that call it Anderson Higgs mechanism. I wish it had been called Anderson Higgs mechanism because in that case, Anderson would have allowed the SSC to be built and the Higgs particle would have been discovered 10 years earlier. So, Anderson made a very important positive contribution, but the way it was being done by Higgs is the one which is being used by uh, particle physicists. Anderson said, hey, X mechanism exists, I showed it in superconductivity, you don't have to build SSC. That, in my opinion, that was a wrong argument. But because of his argument, when people followed it, SSC was killed because of people like Anderson. So, Higgs discovery was delayed by 10 years. That is again Anderson's contribution to Higgs discovery. There is a positive contribution, there is a negative contribution. But it is very important, not only that, BCS theory. BCS theory had, uh, in fact, it is in BCS theory that Anderson discovered spontaneous symmetry breakdown. Like that, there are many things which close connection between particle physics and condensed matter physics. There is no doubt about it. Then now the topological <coughs> insulators and so on. There is so much of field theory and topology and so on. Yeah.
Yeah. Oh yeah, that is another important yes. thing. In which case, uh, we don't hear about stabilizing the mass, but uh, maybe there are more structures. Yeah, so what uh, Murthy um, says is very important. I have assumed that all the particles we are discussing, except proton, neutron, and so on, are all pine particles, OK? <coughs> but they, they may not. They may all be composite. Even quarks may be composite. In particular, Higgs may be composite. In fact, in Anderson's original suggestion, Higgs is a composite, a Cooper pair. So the Higgs with 126G we discovered in particle physics also may be a composite object. So the uh, only thing is at what scale is the compositeness, at what a distance scale. Um, now we the, the, see Higgs experiments are still not over. Many uh, uh, properties of Higgs boson are being um, analyzed by the uh, large hadron collider experimenters, especially its decay properties and so on. Those decay properties might show whether there is a composite uh, structure for Higgs. If that is so, then you don't need this supersymmetry to stabilize it. Yes, that is true. But no, so far no compositeness. Um, I mean, down to even 10-4 minus 18 centimeter, no compositeness uh, has been found yet. Discovering compositeness of Higgs, correspondingly even quarks, uh, will be another great discovery. I have not mentioned it so far. Okay. Thank you all. <coughs>